I'm Mary Claire Speck, North the Bartholomew County Public Library, and I want to wish you a happy George Washington's birthday, and welcome to our event tonight, which is George Washington Slept Here, Barbados. You're going to learn all about a, a part of George's life that a lot of us have never heard about, and also you're going to hear about Barbados, Thomas Jefferson, and the Declaration of Independence. So we hope you enjoy the program. Thank you for watching. And hello to the Bartholomew Library, and thank you, Mary Claire, for inviting me to talk about Washington, Barbados, Jefferson, and some history you might know about. My name is Evan Weiner. I've been in radio and TV since I'm 15 years old, 1971. Uh, in Mount Ivy, New York, I was uh, co-host of a high school radio show called Tiger Talk, Spring Valley High School, about 30 miles north of Manhattan. It's so one of the worst shows you could ever imagine on radio, but it opened the door, and I have to thank Joe Dionisio for doing that. He was my 11th grade English teacher. He said, student, you have a good voice. How would you like to be in radio? And I said, I do in the worst way. Uh, and I was. And uh, Joe also opened the door for me to work at the Nyack Journal News in New York and in New Jersey at the Hackensack. Bergen record. Uh, by 1978, I was a year ahead in school. I had graduated when I was 21. I was on 50,000 watt WNEW radio in New York. Uh, that was the station that had William B. Williams uh, as the afternoon disc jockey. And uh, he gave Frank Sinatra the name chairman of the board. Julius LaRosa was also at that radio station. And I've gone on from there. Among the things I did at WNEW at the age of 23, interviewed Ronald Reagan one-on-one, -on -one, Ted Kennedy one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, my final story for them in 1981 was a Brinks robbery in Nyack, New York. And I've gone on uh, as far as Indianapolis. I spent uh, two years in Indianapolis covering the NFL scaling combine. Uh, that was in 2000 and 2001. Very nice city, Indianapolis. I had a very enjoyable time the uh, two times I was there. Washington, Jefferson, Barbados. Some things you may not have learned very much about when you went to junior high school or high school. George Washington only left North America once in his life when he was 19 years old. Thomas Jefferson may have borrowed something from Barbados for the Declaration of Independence. Washington did go to Barbados in uh, 1751 when he was 19 years old. That is uh, Washington looking at Central Park West in Upper Manhattan in front of a museum. Uh, Washington was very familiar with New York. Uh, after all, he was the first president of the country and the first uh, so-called White House was on Cherry uh, Street down in Lower Manhattan. Washington and me. Uh, and there's Washington, uh, one of the Washington Monument in uh, DC. I had a little problem and they were fixing it up. Um, and that is the Washington Monument, of course. But let's go back to Barbados and let's go to 1649, long before the United States was even an idea in any of the founding fathers' heads or their forefathers, as a matter of fact. Uh, Barbados. Now, Bridgetown, Barbados was the biggest city in North America or in the Western world as far as England was concerned. Uh, Barbados was involved in the English Civil War back in 1649, and that resulted in the defeat and the execution of King Charles I in 1649 and the rise of power uh, to power for Oliver Cromwell, who became the Lord Protector. The war would come to Barbados in 1651 and would end with something called the Charter of Barbados. Now, Thomas Jefferson didn't get around to writing the Declaration of Independence until 125 years later. So how does one have to do with another? Well, never learned this in school. But I did, because I speak on cruise ships, and I've gone to Barbados too many times, and there are some interesting history. United States history, the early days of the United States, all you have to do is read the walls around the uh, port in Barbados, and you learn that history in a hurry. In 1651, many of the English loyalists or who supported, or the royalists who supported King Charles, ended up in Barbados. They didn't want to lose their head like the king. 
So they ended up fleeing to Barbados, buying property in Barbados, and they would, instead of being the loyalists or royalists, they would become the rebels in a sense. And you might be familiar with some of the things that they wanted from England once this war started. Stop. Uh, the, charters, uh, the Charter of Barbados was agreed upon January 11th, 1652, and was ratified at where else? A tavern. They're English, after all. The Mermaid Tavern in Ostains on January 17th. 1652. There were 23 articles addressing religious liberty, Article 1, free trade, taxation, and the authority of the local assembly. If those themes sound familiar, they should. They're all in the Declaration of Independence, but they were floating around 125 years earlier. The Civil War and the Charter of Barbados were done on January 17th, 1652 in a tavern in Osteens. And like I said, you walk around Barbados and you see signs like this. From this vantage point, you could have witnessed one of the naval theaters of the English Civil War, 1642 through 1651. Sir George Eskew commanded a naval blockade of the island of Barbados from his ship, the Rainbow, in Oysten's Bay. Uh, from October 1651 to January 1652. Askew's naval forces were sent to subdue local royalists led by the governor, Lord Willoughby. The stalemate ended in a treaty between the royalists, the loyalists, and parliamentarian functions after the final conflict in Ostades. The Charter of Barbados was signed on 11 January 1652 at the Mermaid Tavern in Ostades. It guaranteed Barbadian colonists their rights to land, local control of taxation, liberty of conscience, access to the courts of law, and limited free trade. The treaty said that no taxes, customs, imports, loans, or excise shall be laid nor levied made on the inhabitants of this island without their consent in a general assembly. Article 3 of the Charter of Barbados signed at the Mermaid Tavern at Osteen's on January 17, 1652. Tavern is long gone, but the sentiment still remains. The Mermaid Tavern in Osteen's was the site of the battle between the Royalists and the Roundheads, which resulted in the signing of the Charter of Barbados Treaty of Osteen's. The uh, Articles of Rendition of the Island from Proprietarial Rights to the Commonwealth Parliament on January 11th, 1652. Now, again, you might be familiar with some of this, but from 1776. This treaty was to ensure that Barbados accepted the authority of the English Parliament and also prevented the local taxes from being raised without local consent. No taxation without representation. It's on the uh, Washington, D.C. license plate, as a matter of fact. Uh, these days. Um, Treaty of Ostens, and this is another picture that uh, you would see in um, uh, Bridgetown. The Treaty of Ostens was negotiated and signed at the Mermaid Tavern, and its concept of no taxation without representation, it is said in Barbados, was the inspiration for the Boston Tea Party in 1773, and subsequently included in the American Declaration of Independence in 1775. How did Jefferson find out about it? That's a question that's never been answered in history. How did Samuel Adams and all the people up in Boston, how did they find out about it? Well, there is some thought that the people who uh, ended up in Barbados decided to go to North America. They ended up in the Carolinas, moved to Virginia, and kind of talked about it. Now remember, Bridgetown, back in the uh, 17th century was the absolute crown jewel of uh, the Commonwealth in North America, the English Commonwealth. And there is Thomas Jefferson at the Jefferson Memorial. Oddly enough, there is no mention of Barbados uh, in the writings that are within the, uh, in the uh, Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. Barbados historians think, and this is what they think, 
The charter in turn influenced the American Declaration of Independence because they thought George Washington on his visit to Barbados in 1751 would have been acquainted with the charter. Now George Washington had, when at the age of 19, had no want to go to Barbados. In fact, he wanted, had no want to have a military career. But a few things happened because he went to Barbados. Now, how did he go to Barbados? Well, that's pretty simple. His half-brother, Lawrence Washington, was suffering from tuberculosis. And the doctors of the day thought, you know, maybe you should go and spend the winter in the tropics. After all, the colonies were a British possession, and so was Barbados. So it was easy to go from the colonies. Well, it wasn't that easy. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to go from the colonies to Barbados, as Washington outlined. But anyway, the 19-year-old George Washington said, um, yeah, I'll go. He had no choice. Lawrence Washington and his wife uh, lost a couple of children in childbirth, and they had a couple of children. And uh, Lawrence Washington's wife said, I'm not going with you. <laughs> Find somebody else. And he looked and he looked and he said, you, George, you're going with me. And George, if you go to uh, his home in Mount Vernon, uh, there are some writings about his time in Barbados. The, and this is what uh, he wrote about. Um, the brothers apparently sailed on a ship called the Success, a small trading sloop. The voyage took about six weeks. Now, if you went, say, from Charleston, South Carolina, which would be the closest big port that a cruise ship goes from, to Barbados, it would take about three days, about three days on a big ship uh, to go from Charleston, South Carolina, which is not that far from Mount Vernon. Um, and Washington talked about the Atlantic Ocean, and he called the Atlantic Ocean fickle. Merciless. Notice how he spelled merciless, M-E-R-C-I-L-I-S-S. -S. Merciless ocean. Uh, and they ended up at this place. Uh, it was Gedney Clark's house. It is still in Barbados. Uh, it is uh, a historic site, obviously, not far from the Sandals Hotel, because you know, Barbados is all resorts. But uh, it is still there. And that is where George Washington spent the only six weeks of his life not on North American soil. Washington recorded everything in his diary, the weather, the details about sailing, the fish they caught or tried to catch. Uh, these included dolphin, pilot fish, shark, barracuda, tiger fish. Uh, and by November 2nd, 1751, the brothers docked along with the rest of the crew. Now, they did not get greeted by this, Carlisle Bay of Barbados, but this is where they landed, or near where they landed. Uh, Carlos Bay, Barbados is a big fishing area. Uh, Barbados is not an easy place to get into necessarily. It's surrounded by a, a deep shelf uh, located about uh, two to three kilometers offshore. There are also three types of reefs around Barbados, the barrier reefs, patch reefs, and uh, friendly reefs. Uh, the coral reefs uh, are, are reefs are around, and um, you gotta watch out. You gotta watch out when you get there, and it's not easy to uh, dock if you were in a ship like the Success. The English settled the island in 1627. That's a bit more than two decades uh, before sugar would be king, and sugar would become king in the 1650s. Big sugar trade, big slave trade. Uh, and Barbados became extraordinarily wealthy because of both the sugar and the slave trade. Barbados was one of Britain's most precious colonial possessions. Bridgetown, where the Washingtons landed, was one of the most populous cities uh, in British America. And uh, Gedney Clark, who was an uncle of uh, Lawrence Washington's wife, said, come to my house. And they did. And uh, Washington in his diary confessed that uh, he had some reluctance staying at the house, not because his brother had tuberculosis, but Mrs. Clark had smallpox. And smallpox was a plague back in those days. And guess who caught smallpox? George Washington. He had it within two weeks. He would recover, and ultimately, 
because he had smallpox then, it turned out to be actually a good thing for him because he became immune and that would help him 25 years later in the Revolutionary War. Now, somehow Washington gets involved with the British Navy. There's no explanation as to why the British Navy took him in, but he meets all of these people. Clark, of course, uh, had that house and probably knew influential people on the island. In Washington, they probably looked at him. He's six foot four. He is tall and he is strong. And they probably looked at him and said, hmm, that's an interesting guy. Uh, so he gets access to the British Navy as far as uh, he starts in 1651. And he starts looking at the island defenses. And Washington concludes that Barbados actually was one entire, I-N-T-I-R-E, fortification. It was a naval base. And he begins to learn military maneuvers in his, well, after he gets the smallpox, in his time, which is about six, seven weeks, in Barbados. And actually is a very quick study. And the British are pleased with him because he is a quick study. He's also a tall, strong guy. He'd be great for their military. And after all, he is a British citizen. And uh, this is still there. Um, this, the wall with the cannons, obviously, the cannons are in use. In fact, one cannon ended up uh, in the ocean there. But uh, he was right. It is literally one entire fortress, even to this day. Uh, they, the Washingtons would go home. Uh, Lawrence Washington would die of tuberculosis at the Mount Vernon home in July of 1752. Meanwhile, George Washington is 20 years old at this point. Uh, he was never sent to the prestigious schools back in England. Uh, and he kind of was trying to figure out what he's going to do in life. Maybe be a surveyor, maybe something else. Um, but um, his provincial world, there weren't that many people in Virginia, and he was at the plantation most of the time. But his provincial world was suddenly expanded. And while he's in Barbados, he makes contact, contact with very influential people in Bridgetown. And those people would be there as his career would go on. Washington decides he's going to have a military career in the British military. So after he returns to Virginia, he dedicates himself to the advancement in the military more completely than any of his Virginia contemporaries. He wanted a commission in the regular British military establishment and that ambition, according to historians at uh, Mount Vernon in uh, Virginia, his home, that ambition probably was prompted uh, and stimulated by his experience in Barbados. In December 1752, George Washington is 20 years old. That's all he is. He's 20 years old, and he has about six weeks of military experience in Barbados just looking at what was going on. In September, of rather December of 1752, Washington, who has no previous military experience, is made the commander of Britain's Virginia militia. And he would see action in the French and Indian War and was eventually put in charge of all of Virginia's military forces. Um, George might have been tall, but he was very green and he wasn't very good on the battlefield initially. In and he's 21 at this point. In 1753, Washington was sent as an ambassador from the British Crown to meet with French officials and Indians uh, about the future as far north as the present day settlement of Erie, Pennsylvania, which actually was part of New York in those days. New York sold the port to Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania had uh, no port on uh, the Great Lakes. And so New York sold the land. Uh, in 1754, he was in what is now Pittsburgh, helping to build the fort where the three rivers uh, form uh, in Pittsburgh. And, and he wanted to build the fort. He helped build the fort there because it was time to claim that land. After all, you had the three rivers, Mahanganelia, uh, the Allegheny, and the Ohio River, and one went north, one went south, one went west, great place. 
Uh, but before reaching that point, he and some of his men, who were accompanied by Indian allies, they're ambushed by a French scaling party. And the leader of the French scaling party is killed. And that brings all kind of repercussions uh, to General, uh, to George Washington and uh, his men. The French responded by attacking fortifications that Washington erected following the ambush, and he surrenders. He gets released on parole. He and his troops go back to Virginia and try to figure out what they did wrong and what's the next thing they have to do. Um, he becomes a surveyor. He kind of leaves the military behind after the humiliation. But uh, the English call him back. He's about 24 years old. And he's in the middle of the French and Indian War, which started in 1756, um, or the Seven Years' War. And he's right there. He's right in the middle of it. And uh, he, he is in charge of the Virginia Regiment. Uh, Washington shaped that unit into one of the best provincial military units in the colonies. But it wasn't working for George, and you'll see why in a minute. He rigorously disciplined, often punishing transgressions with the lash. Um, hey, you want to the dessert? He'll take care of you. He catches you, he hangs you. Um, you know, don't desert. And uh, so he's tough. He was tough. He was everything that the English army was looking for, uh, bold and tough. Uh, but he wasn't good on the battlefield. And um, he loses on the battlefield. And he gets into fights with the British governor of Virginia, Robert Dimwitty. And he says, that's it. I'm gone. I'm out of here. The military isn't for me. So he returns to Williamsburg, Virginia, and would eventually marry Martha, and resigns from the Virginia military to become a farmer and then a politician. On January 6, 1759, he marries uh, Martha, Martha Dandridge Custis, and also becomes a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses for the next 16 years of his life. Between 1759, he lived the life of a plantation owner and a politician, and he missed all the action. And while he's gone, all the action is taking place that would eventually lead him to come back and become the commander of the Revolutionary Army. That's Quebec City. And uh, you're looking at uh, the Quebec Parliament there. Um, and uh, I speak on cruise ships again. And being that I speak on cruise ships, one of the ports that, uh, except for the last year, I always go to and enjoy is Quebec City. And Quebec City is where a lot of uh, the North American modern history starts, at least the modern history between Upper Canada and the colonies, the Brits, and eventually the Americans, nothing west of the Mississippi, and certainly nothing south where the Spaniards were in Mexico. But a lot of history is decided one place in Quebec City, the Plains of Abraham. And Washington, Washington misses out on all of it. That's uh, uh, O Canada, and uh, that's one of the places that uh, marks the battle that took place on the Plains of Abraham that eventually would decide the fate of at least Eastern Canada and Eastern United States. Uh, and there's the fortress uh, of Quebec City. Uh, the lower city is where uh, the poor people live. The higher city was where the rich people lived and also where the fortifications were uh, that the French put up in the event of an English invasion. Uh, and Montcalm, Montcalm, he was the French general who was defeated here. He received his mortal wounds on September 13, 1759, the Plains of Abraham, which flips history. Uh, in 1759, the British, under the command of General James Wolfe, besieged Quebec City for three months. The city was defended by the French general, the Marquis de Montcalm. Uh, and that is the uh, Plains of Abraham, looking at the Hotel Frontenac, uh, which is uh, down there. Um, and that's where things would uh, change. Uh, when you are on top of the hill, you look down at the St. Lawrence Seaway. And the British came in through the St. Lawrence Seaway to take over Quebec City. Now, there was a fortification, but the fortification kind of ends at the cliffs. 
And the French felt, well, you know what? That's not a problem. Uh, anybody who's opposing us, they're not going to go up the cliffs. If they come up and they see uh, the fortress, the Citadel, they'll have a problem. But the cliffs, no, it's not going to be a problem because they're too steep and nobody's going to climb up the cliffs. Now, a little bit about Quebec City. In 1605, the French colonists established the first permanent European settlement in future Canada and the first settlement north of Florida at Port Royal. Uh, and that would be known as uh, Acadia. Uh, in Nova Scotia, Louisbourg, French settlement in 1713, 1730, biggest military fortress in North America, and they were French, fell to the English in 1758. Uh, in 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht gave Cape Britain and Prince Edward Island to the French. And there is uh, now a scale model of a uh, fortress, which used to be four times the size. It was built, uh, rebuilt as a tourist attraction starting in the 1960s uh, in Cape Britain because, uh, frankly, there's nothing to do in Cape Britain and they wanted tourists. Uh, Lewisburg was captured by the British in 1758, demolished. Some of it was reconstructed. Uh, some of it you know about if you uh, were, if you read Longfellow, because he wrote Evangeline about what was the exile of the French from Nova Scotia. And let's be clear here, it was ethnic cleansing. So a lot of things are going on. Nova Scotia and Quebec next to each other, and Washington is at home. Uh, there is the lighthouse in uh, Lewisburg. Uh, and uh, if you walk in Halifax, uh, this will kind of tell you something. It's kind of, we're sorry if we did this, we're sorry we did that as Canadians or as Brits. And uh, if you look closely at that picture, you will see Nova Scotia and how the exile went from Nova Scotia. Some went to back to France, some went to, uh, to Africa, some went to Louisiana. And the reason America has Cajun culture is that those some who went to Louisiana kept their culture. Uh, when they ended up in Louisiana and lived through that culture, and that culture still exists 250 years uh, or so later, 350 or so years later. The French and Indian War was the uh, last war between England and France in Canada, and the Mississippi and the Great Lakes line. The English took Canada, and the rest should have been history, right? Wrong. Uh, George Washington is becoming increasingly upset being a Brit in the 1760s, as were the Massachusetts people. Now, if you looked at the old map of the United States or the Southern colonies and the Northern colonies, Northern colonies being what is today Canada, um, Nova Scotia extended into, or was, New Brunswick was part of Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia had a common border with then Massachusetts. Uh, separated by a river. Uh, Massachusetts was Maine back in those days. Uh, and so people would go back and forth between Nova Scotia and Massachusetts and start talking to one or another about what was going on. And the Nova Scotians would say, hey, they pulled all the troops out of here. They're gone. The best troops are all gone. And that plants a seed in the Massachusetts people. Washington never would get a commission in the English army, despite being the commander of chief of all forces in defense of Her Majesty's colony in Virginia. Nothing really was going on down in Virginia, and he missed all the major action in the French and Indian War. So he should be forgotten, should be gone. We should never know about George Washington again. He's in Virginia, but he's becoming upset. 1760s and 1770s. The war is done, but tensions between the English colonists and England we're rising because of taxes, taxes without representation. The English had to pay for all these wars. And they're looking and they're looking and they're looking. And they say, hey, wait a minute. These people in uh, the southern colonies, they have some money. They're landowners. They have money. So let's start taxing them. And let's start paying off the debts from the other wars. The Treaty of Paris ends the French and Indian War between Great Britain and France. Great Britain is not engaged in a war with any country for the first time in more than 50 years. Parliament says, okay, let's take care of what we got in North America. We got all this land um, north of the St. Lawrence River. We got all this land south of the St. Lawrence River. They're called the Northern Colonies and the Southern Colonies. Let's see if we can get money out of our colonies in North America. 
Seven Year War, gone. Uh, in that conflict with France, Britain incurred an enormous debt because uh, they took over Quebec. They took over Nova Scotia. Uh, and they're looking and they're looking and looking and we got to pay for this. How are we going to pay for it? Ah, we'll get Ben Franklin to pay for it. We'll get John Hancock to pay for it. We'll get George Washington to pay for it. Uh, they're watching closely in the southern colonies. They know England is one in Quebec and they know that they chased all of the French out of Nova Scotia. And uh, how they did that was simple. They uh, got all the men together uh, and they put them on this little island in Halifax um, Harbor. And if you survive there, you got shipped out. If you didn't, you die. That was the end of that. Like I said, ethnic cleansing. So they take uh, over uh, from uh, the French in Nova Scotia, although they would eventually say, hey, you could come back, we need your help. Uh, 1763, English Parliament issues the Proclamation of 1763 prohibiting settlement in the American colonies west of the Appalachian Mountains. This gets George Washington a bit upset, along with other people in Virginia. The proclamation is greatly resented in Virginia, and of course Washington is a politician, House of Burgess is at that point. More is coming. 1765, Parliament imposes the Stamp Act for taxing the American colonies. People didn't like the Stamp Act. Patrick Henry introduces the Stamp Act resolves in the Virginia House of Burgesses, of which George Washington is a member. These resolves challenge Great Britain's right to impose the tax. Parliament repealed, the English Parliament repealed the Stamp Act, but passes a new act, the Declaratory Act, which asserts Great Britain's right to pass any laws governing the American colonies. Now you know, oh, about uh, 115 years later, uh, earlier rather, 114 years earlier, the Brits said, okay, hands off Barbados. They're not doing it to the colonists. In 1767, Parliament imposes the Townsend duties, taxing imports of tea, glass, paper, lead, and paint in the American colonies. The grip is getting tighter and the protests are beginning to manifest themselves. Washington probably knew that the English pulled their best troops out of North America, and he decides he's gonna go on a scouting trip, and he's gonna see if he can find some of his former Indian friends to help him out, because Washington by this point decided, I don't wanna be a member, I don't want the English anymore. Uh, by the late 1760s, Washington had experienced firsthand the effects of rising taxes imposed on American colonists by Britain and came to believe it would be in the best interest of the colonists to declare their independence from England. So he goes on the scouting trip. He opposed the Stamp Act in 1767. He opposed the Townsend Act and in 1774 imposed the Intolerable Act. But like I said, he went looking for allies and I decided I was gonna eavesdrop on George's talk with, with one of his uh, old allies, uh, one of the tribes uh, in, uh, on Mount Washington, now it's called Mount Washington, in what is now known as the Pittsburgh area, but uh, it was in Fort Pitt. And you can see if you're a football fan back there, Pittsburgh Steelers uh, home football field there. But George didn't care about that, at least not now. He's looking and he's got to discuss something important. So he takes a trip up the river and goes looking for allies. And he is looking for allies and trying to convince them it would be in the best interest to kick the British out. And so he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, and he's kind of trying to build consensus among people that it is best for the Southern colonists to say goodbye. 1773. The British Parliament passes the Tea Act. The Boston Tea Party takes place in Boston, Massachusetts, a party of nearly 50 men disguised as Indians, led by Samuel Adams, uh, who is now a brewmaster, right? Uh, board ships, they break open 343 or 342 chests of tea, and they empty them in the Boston Harbor. And if you want to empty some tea in the Boston Harbor these days, you can, when there's no pandemic. You could go up there and for 10 bucks, go on one of those uh, boats, have some tea and throw it into the Charles River. Uh, you could do that today. It's a tourist attraction today. 1773, 
it was a place of war. Uh, seeking to boost the troubled East Indian Company, the British Parliament adjusted import duties. Uh, while consignees in Charleston, South Carolina, New York, and Philadelphia rejected tea shipments, the merchants in Boston decided, we're going to do something else. Uh, we're not going to face your pressure in Charleston or down the road in New York or Philadelphia. No, 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 no. We're going to take it. But they have other plans. Uh, on the night of December 16, 1773, Samuel Adams, before he was a beer, Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty boarded three ships in the Boston Harbor and threw 342 chests of tea overboard. And the Brits would get really, really mad in Parliament. This resulted in the passage of the punitive coercive acts in 1774. So the noose is tightening and people are deciding we're not going to take this anymore. The corrosive, corrosive acts. The acts of 1770, it probably were corrosive to the Brits. Uh, the acts of 1774 were intended to punish the colony in general, but Boston in particular, because of the Tea Party and the pattern of resistance it exemplified. Um, is there's some dispute in Massachusetts as to where the first shots of the Revolutionary War were fired. Now, that's the Berkshire Mountains, the western part of the state. Uh, that is in Great Barrington, uh, Pittsfield. Pittsfield's about two hours by car from Boston, so over 100 miles from Boston, um, which was in those days quite a length. Uh, anyway, uh, as you know, the shots heard around the world are supposedly in 1775. But if you go to the courthouse in Berkshire County in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and I spent summers up there speaking at local groups as well, uh, and, and hanging out a little bit in the Berkshires under normal circumstances. Uh, near this spot stood the first courthouse of Berkshire County, erected 1764. Here, August 16th, 1774, occurred the first open resistance to British rule in America. Now, they claim that there, but I would think the Boston Tea Party was kind of resistant and even Patrick Henry's uh, address and, and others uh, not supporting uh, the various acts that came down in the 1760s and 1770s, you would think that that was resistance. But they claim in Berkshire County, in Great Barrington, in the United States, it was at Berkshire, in Berkshire County, that the first resistance took place, August 16th, 1774. There were skirmishes between British troops and colonial militiamen in Lexington and Concord, shot her around the world. Remember that? Shot her around the world must have been one loud boom in April 1775, and that kicked off the armed conflict. In 1775, these guys are getting the, the, the you know, founding fathers, and the founding fathers were only people who owned land. That was it. They were not common people. They were landowners. They were rich people. And they were upset about paying taxes. That's who they were. And they made no secret about it. That's who they were. The Second Continental Congress meets in Philadelphia. Peyton Randolph is reelected president to the Congress. George Washington. George Washington shows up. He doesn't show up in typical garb of the 1770s. He shows up in his old uniform from when he was part of the British Army back in the 1750s. So he's named Commander-in-Chief of the American Forces. He's the only one who wanted the job. And yeah, big, tall, strong guy, uh, looked the part, looked the part, totally looked the part, and nobody else wanted the job, so George kind of gets it by default. Meanwhile, King George III declares the American colonies in rebellion. Uh, Washington appeared at the Second Continental Congress in a military uniform, signaling, to war, to war, I'm prepared to go to war. He had the prestige, he had the military experience, although he wasn't very good on the battlefield, but he had the military experience and he had charisma. So George, here's your job. You whip this army into shape, and let's beat the Brits. Uh, again, back in the 1650s, in 1651, and then while he's part of the British uh, military in the 1650s, he closely observed British military tactics. 
he gained a keen insight into their strengths and their weaknesses, and that would provide invaluable during the revolution. One other thing that would provide invaluable, he had smallpox. He wasn't going to get it again. And George wasn't the type of guy who sat behind the desk. He went into battle with his guys. He was shot at. Uh, so he was there. He was there with his guys. And his guys loved him. And uh, he was able to convince them when they didn't have shoes and, and they weren't getting paid. Hang tough. Hang tough. Hang tough. We're going to win this thing. Washington had the ability uh, to keep the struggling colonial army together. His troops were poorly trained, uh, lacked food, ammunition, and other supplies. Uh, the soldiers uh, went without shoes in the winter. He was able to give them direction and motivation to keep going, and he also would get major assists. Uh, one from uh, Baron von Steuben, who uh, was thrown out of the German army, who became very invaluable to him. He was recruited by Ben Franklin when Franklin was uh, in Europe. He also got the French on his side. So these uh, poorly trained troops that lack food, lack money, lack ammunition. In fact, they lack so much uh, money and ammunition that when Washington had a chance to go into Nova Scotia and take over Nova Scotia, he decided, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna do it because I don't have the money or the ammunition. I can't spend that money on bullets to get Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia would have been an interesting pickup for him uh, in terms that Halifax is one of the great ports in, in the world. Um, even though it's cold in Halifax, the port never freezes because it's part of the Gulf Stream and it's a deep water port. But uh, the Southern colonists did have Boston, they did have New York, and they did have Charleston, South Carolina. So that was enough for them. But Washington kept them going, kept them going, kept them going until the reinforcements came in. Uh, von Steuben gave him a big, big hand along with the French. Uh, the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia it was a long time ago. That was 1999. Uh, the Americans uh, would win in 1781. Uh, with the assistance of France, they would beat England in Yorktown. The war is just about done, and there's two years worth of negotiation um, before the final treaty is worked out. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Washington, a little bit about Jefferson, and a little bit about uh, everybody else. First of all, the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock. John Hancock probably was the richest guy uh, in the southern colonies, as uh, the British called them at that point. Uh, and he knew something about George III, King George III, who the Americans or the Southern colonists wanted to run away from. Uh, he knew he was nearsighted. And when the Declaration of Independence was written and everybody had to sign it, he made sure he put his name as the biggest name there. Why? Because he wanted King George III to see it. Now, as far as Jefferson, Somewhere along the line, he had to pick up the Charter of Barbados and the Treaty of Ostens. He had to pick that up somewhere along the line. And the reason why, there's just too much coincidence in there uh, between the document from 1652 and the document from 1776, 124 years later, which leads to another question. Was uh, Jefferson, was Hancock, was Washington, was John Adams, all of these people, all of these people, were they traitors, yes or no? The answer is, they were traitors. They were rebels looking to form their own country. So here they are uh, the forefathers, um, the men of wisdom that shaped the United States. But as far as Britain was concerned, they were traitors. And the 4th of July is a day that we celebrate, but it should be more like the 1st of July or 2nd by July. This is when the document was finished, the Declaration of Independence. But these guys knew that if they released it and everybody converts on Philadelphia, it'd be a lot of trouble. They could have been hanged. So they decided, hey, let's get out of here, let's flee. And they fled. And on July 4th, 1776, it was read. The United States declared uh, their independence from England and King Charles III was not a very happy camper in England, uh, and it was to war they went. Uh, the war ends in 1783. Washington, Washington says goodbye. And where else would uh, former uh, 
British citizens, now American citizens, but with a lot of Brit Brits in their blood, where else would Washington say goodbye? But in a tavern, Francis Tavern, down in lower Manhattan. Now, it's kind of an interesting place because uh, it also served as a seat of government in the fledgling United States. So here we are, we, you're in a tavern, and yet this is where the seat of government is, lower Manhattan uh, back in the day. Washington says his goodbyes in 1783. The tavern becomes the seat of the government. Today, it's still a bar. It's also a museum. Um, Washington decides to go home. That's it. The country is going to, um, going to try to make it on its own. But there's no central part. There's no central government. Um, there are 13 different states. There's also Vermont that isn't a state yet. Uh, that's up there, but it's kind of a territory at that point. And um, yeah, they got the government, sure. They have no money. There's no money in the United States. Um, and everything is ragtag. The army was ragtag. And um, they did owe a lot to France at this point in terms of getting things going. So, you know, there's, you know, the, they're staggering out of the starting blocks as a country. But they're still having conventions. There is the Article of Confederation. But uh, that wasn't viewed all that highly. But so let's have a, a constitutional convention. And they would, 1787 in Philadelphia. And, uh, yeah, George at this point is 55 years old. He's enjoying the plantation lifestyle with Martha. And, um, yeah, he's, yeah, he's just hanging out in retirement. And he's rich. He doesn't need this. But, hey, George, move. Let's go. Let's go. Why? Let's go. They need you. So he's a delegate from Virginia. And uh, he goes up there. And everybody looks, there's George Washington. There's George Washington. He won the war. He won the war. He won the war. Yeah, he did win the war. Um, hey, you know, George, this is a good idea. Why don't you become the president of the convention? George becomes the president of the convention. Uh, and then he decides to let loose with his criticisms. And there were many. A lot. Uh, he had considerable criticism of the Article of Confederation of the 13 colonies. He didn't think very much of it because there was a weak central government. Uh, and he referred to the Articles of Confederation as no more than a rope of sand to support the new nation. And he learned firsthand that um, you needed a central government because you needed money for a military. And there was no money for the military. It came from here, there, and everywhere, but it didn't come from any central location. So his view was, you need a strong federal government. He experienced it during the Revolutionary War. And uh, the other part was that the Continental Congress couldn't get the states to say, hey, let's pony up. We need money for the military. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. So Washington, who has considerable clout at this point, decides, okay, this is what we need. Um, and there is Federal Hall in uh, Lower Manhattan near Wall Street. This place matters is because this place is where George Washington took the oath of office to become the first president of the United States. He won the presidency beating John Adams. Back in those days, the president was the president. The guy who came in second became the vice president. Uh, it was kind of unwieldy for a while until they straightened out the system. But uh, Washington becomes the president, and he he pretty much with Alexander Hamilton, build a government, a central government. Washington appointed all of the high-ranking officials in the executive and judicial branch. He shaped numerous political practices. And his aide-de-camp was this guy, Alexander Hamilton, who was a major power broker back in his day before he became a Broadway star of our day. Hamilton was a really smart guy, and he was an aide during, uh, to Washington during the war. And Washington looked at his protege and said, you know what, I like your economic pro uh, policies. Hamilton wanted the federal government to assume the debts of state governments, and he established the first bank 
of the United States and the United States Mint and established the first bank of the United States uh, and the United States Customs Service. Uh, he and uh, Thomas Jefferson would get into a discussion about where the capital should be. Because back in those days, um, Georgia was a long way away from New York and Boston was a rather short distance and you traveled by horseback in those days. So a compromise is, is met as you would, if you watched Hamilton, you know what the compromise is. Hamilton wanted the money. He didn't care about to see the government. Hamilton wanted the money. Uh, and money makes the world go round. And he made New York the financial capital of the United States. And ultimately, it is one of the financial capitals of the world. He said, take your government wherever you want. And they found this plot of land. They first go down to Philadelphia. And then they take the plot of land and they uh, find uh, in between Maryland and Virginia in the swamp. Uh, and they name it the District of Columbia. And that would become the seat of the government and was named after Washington. Uh, and if you're ever in New York, uh, if this pandemic is over, and you want to see a beautiful structure, and you want to go in and not pay anything, you go into this place. This is the Hamilton Customs House, and uh, it is a magnificent structure near the uh, Wall Street and uh, Staten Island Ferry, and uh, it's a Smithsonian uh, Museum. So they have exhibits in there. And uh, it's really a neat place to go. And uh, I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and my grandmother worked uh, in the DMV. She was part of the political process uh, and got a political job. And I remember going there when that place was desolate. They have really done a great job of cleaning that place up. Um, Washington, one of the greatest presidents ever in the poll of historians. His stay in Barbados was extremely important because he learned about the military. Barbados has an interesting, uh, interesting part of American history. Um, in Barbados, Washington learned his craft. From Barbados, Jefferson got some text, but he may not have been the only one that got the text because there were others who screamed and yelled about taxation without representation. It would be Jefferson who would put that into uh, context, into uh, a paper. Uh, as far as uh, Washington goes, um, he decides not to run for re-election for 1789, uh, rather 17, uh, 1798. He doesn't campaign for re-election in 1798. Uh, he put down a, a lot of problems. Uh, his um, administration for the first eight years did have a tremendous amount of problems uh, with the North and South. Um, and basically it was money, some spies here and there, and the Brits were always after uh, the territory. And the Brits would come back after the territory uh, in the War of 1812. Uh, you could also say the Americans wanted to get rid of the Brits also, finally in 1812 and uh, seized that land by the Great Lakes. Uh, it may be part of uh, Canada. Uh, the 1812, War of 1812 basically ended up uh, in the tie. Uh, the uh, final borders between England and the United States were established. Um, the Brits did burn down the White House in uh, 1814, uh, but the Americans would prevail and beat the Brits in the Navy or in the ocean, in the waters. And after that, the Brits were no problem at all, even though the Brits uh, did kind of help the South in the Civil War between 1861 and 1865. So Washington has his place uh, in history as one of the greatest presidents, if not the greatest president, because he invented the presidency and he turned down the chance of being a king. Didn't want to be a king. Being the president was good enough for him. Um, Jefferson, of course, also uh, is uh, well remembered, maybe not as well remembered as president and as the Declaration of Independence. Washington really never extended the United States. Jefferson did buy uh, the Louisiana Territory from France because France needed money to support their wars in the uh, 1800s, beginning of the 1800s. Uh, Washington would die in 1799 at the age of 67. Um, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Barbados. As far as Barbados, 
Um, it became an independent country eventually. Um, it was the crown jewel of the British Empire even after um, the, they lost the United States, uh, and that would stay until the end of slavery in uh, the 19th century. Um, but uh, Washington, Barbados, and Jefferson, three prongs of uh, the American Revolution, and uh, Barbados does not get any uh, props really as uh, being important in the American Revolution. Well, I want to thank Mary Claire for inviting me. I want to thank everybody at the Bartholomew, Li Bartholomew Library uh, for having me. And I hope everybody is well. I hope everybody enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, my email is E-D-A-N-J-W-E-I-N-E-R, Evan J. Wiener at gmail.com. And again, thank you, Mary Claire, for inviting me. Thank you for being such a nice audience to me. I hope to see you in the future. My name is Evan Wiener. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.